All right, so moving on, uh, we first, in the first half an hour, we had a, an introduction to what relationship with publishers is or going uh, on your own. And now we're going to go a deep dive. We're going to go into what does it mean to work with a publisher and what are the requirements, what kind of relationship you will have. So all is going to be talking about that. Hello. Everyone comfortable? It's great to be here in Amsterdam. No, but seriously, uh, hello, welcome to the lecture. I'm really happy that uh, it's pretty much, it's close to crowded. I'm very happy with that. It is an honor to be here in Amsterdam and, and to get to share my thoughts and experiences on, on this particular topic with people. Uh, if there's one thing I think about the games industry is that the more we share and critically discuss and put our thoughts out there, uh, the further we will go as an industry. And this presentation and information is, is not the right arena for uh, competition, but rather for sharing and collaboration. So let's uh, keep trucking. Let's talk about games and why we make them. I know why I make games, so I'm going to ask a couple of rhetorical questions. Why do you make games? I'm going to assume a lot of people in this room are game makers of various descriptions. Do you make it, do them for art? Would you, might you, you mean, there may be, you may be in a space where you might as well be painting or drawing. Do you do it for money? Who doesn't want to get rich or at least feed the cat? pay the rent, fame, everlasting, appreciation of your peer, you're a craftsman, you want to be really, you want to go on to, a, what do I know, conceptart.org and everybody likes you and, and likes your advice. Or for the challenge, you're a sporty type of person. You could be, you know, an athlete or something, but you eventually ended up here instead because you want to make games better than other people. All fair, all good motivations, but I'm going to delineate. If you actually want your games to get out there and reach an audience that's not just you know, your friends and your family, you're going to have to get it made through one of, I think, three major paths. One is the ever popular sweat equity. You work for free and you work your ass off. Uh, pardon my French. Think of that as the dark lightning path here. One is investment. You have money, you've saved up money, you've won the lottery, you've made a deal with a business angel, your dad, your mum, your uncle, you've met a VC that really believes in your idea because you're an experienced entrepreneur, and that's great. That's a great way of getting a company done. If you have neither, or if you reach a point where you run out of either, you're going to probably want to consider work for hire. Working with someone who has money and a vested interest in publishing and, and distributing games, uh, who can pay for the game development and help you get your game out there. Think of that as the middle path, really. If you have all the money in the world, that's the green pastures of yore. So, I'm going to demarcate, delineate, make some definitions to get going here. First off, this is, not about, this is a talk about commercial games. Games for money, games that hopefully make you grow a bit more successful and richer over time. Uh, it's based on my general observations from 19 years in the games industry and working with different parties. It's from my personal experience. It's important to know that this is not science. It's not peer-reviewed or anything else. But hopefully this perspective will be useful to you. And it's not a definitive how-to guide on exactly how to be successful in dealing with publishers or being an indie. And it's not about making games as a hobby or as an artistic expression, though I certainly applaud anyone doing that. So the word indie gets thrown around a lot. Beautiful indies. We all want to be them, yes? Uh, well, some of us want to be them. Some people somewhere want to be them. Uh, but when I say indie for the purposes of this presentation, I will mean an independently owned developer that's not traded on a major exchange of some sort, that doesn't have a major institutional investor backing them with their demands and perspectives. Let's say founder owned or, or owned by a close group of people who meet each other face to face regularly. Basically, you're in a situation where it's your money and your time, and in this presentation, that makes you an indie. What's a big boy? A big boy is a major publisher in this case, someone with a multinational presence, uh, someone who has already a large portfolio of games, of which your game or games will be only a tiny fraction, and someone who is you regularly working with first, second, third party developers so that you fit in sort of a stable. You, you're getting my definition, I hope. Nod if you understand. Nods, good. Let's keep going. Let's establish ethos. Why should you be listening to me and why was I even invited? Uh, 
I can't an answer why I was invited, but I can give you these reasons. I work for Tasha Studios, 36 people out of Malmö, founder owned my, primarily. A lovely studio of which I'm currently the head. I used to have a studio called Junebud up until a year and a half ago when we were bankrupt because we couldn't handle the harsh realities of the market. Uh, 20 people also based off in Malmö. I used to teach at the University of Skövde as game design for the game design program. I used to work at DICE as a lead game designer, among other titles, Battlefield 1942. I used to work for Refraction Games before by DICE bought Refraction Games, and we made games such as Codename Eagle and The Legacy of Rosemont Hill. And I worked for Hardcore Media, which was a tiny outfit, three people making miniatures war games back in 1995, and, and funding it through our own sweat equity. And there's a, an anecdote here. We met Steve Jackson of Steve Jackson Games fame at a convention. We just printed the whole thing and we were distributing through local merchants and at conventions. And he sat down and looked at the game and we discussed it. And when he found out that we had printed 200 copies, physical copies, he looked at us and said, I can see you guys aren't in it for the money. And that stayed with me. He was right. We were doing it for the love of making games. I also used to be an illustrator and a part-time artist and painted and had my own studio and being on my own and making art for the sake of art is something I have familiarity with. I also worked with Sony, Sony Com Computer Entertainment Europe specifically. I worked with EA for Battlefield, with Microsoft for a launch title for the Xbox console called Rally, Rally Sport Challenge. I worked with Area Games and Entertainment distributing tablet games and browser games. I worked with Mentes, at the time, uh, the largest social games publisher in Brazil and South America. And I'm here to make two points. Because you shouldn't make too many points during a lecture, it gets confusing, and I have limited time. One, when you make games as an independent, you have agency, and by agency, I mean personal initiative, and you have some freedom of action that is maybe not afforded to you as wholly owned or dependent on a financier. But the second point is perhaps the most important point. You've chosen to have a customer that must be respected. You're not talking to every gamer in the world that wants to download from the App Store or you know, whoever you're targeting with ads on Facebook or something like that. You have a main customer or two main customers, publishers, that you have a deep and long-reaching relationship with and that needs to be respected and nurtured. Uh, and as I will be touching on, it will most probably be an unequal partnership. And you're not the more powerful part in this partnership. Spoiler. Tasha Studios, yes, lovely, founded in 2005. A small group of students made uh, the city of Metronome. Show the demo on E3 that year huge hit with both, both gaming fans and publishers. Publishers come and knock and go, yeah, yeah, what can we do if this is a title we could get in on? Turns out it's like five students with no experience. And the idea of funding a triple A based off of that for the next generation of consoles died. But the eye of Sauron was upon the team uh, for the fact that now this indie effort had garnered attention and respect of a lot of games interested people. Uh, our most famous release to date is Little Big Planet for the PlayStation Vita, which is a Tasha-made game that has been hailed as, by some as the best game on Vita. Currently 88 Metacritic, over 10% attach rate, which means over one person in 10 that owns a Vita has bought this game. Very happy with that. We did work on LBP1 and LBP2 as well as support for Media Molecule. Uh, we've done LBP themes for PlayStation Home, and we did a wonderful little game called Ragdoll Kung Fu Fists of Plastic. Uh, we had made our own physics-based fighter and was pitching that to Sony, and they said, yeah, we're already looking at this weirdo browser game called Ragdoll Kung Fu. Can you put that on PSN? And that thing couldn't go on PSN. It was like Flash or something. So we basically married our prototype with the concept and made a new game out of that, under that IP. Today, Tarsha is a lovely place uh, with bean bags. And the founders owned the majority of the company, a number of senior staff who got to buy in at, at a certain point, or also owners. There's one or two external board members, like the chairman also was allowed to opt in and buy shares. There was a local commerce trust from the tiny little city where Tasha was founded that invested uh, like 20,000 euros very early on. And they're making their exit this year, and after that it will pretty much only be 
people working hands on with the company owning it. So it fits my definition of indie. Whenever you do business, you have to be aware of your stakeholders. This is not rocket science, yes? First off, it's probably the most noticeable ones are your coworkers because you see them face to face and they ask you annoying questions or, or very angry questions if you don't behave. Second off, it's a company with owners and they're not always working in the company and they want to know, is my investment safe? Will there be success? Is my company dying under your guidance or the leadership being provided? But last but not least, remember the second point, yes? It's a business and a business is nothing without customers. Then it's a hobby or research and design, it's not a business. So not art, not hobby. So let's say you're working with a big publisher, yes? And some of this will be tangent to what went before in the previous lecture, which was very informative and entertaining. Let's talk about some pros. Yes, there can be steady funding as long as you deliver to milestone specs and you've been uh, curating your business partnership so you're not partnered up with some asshat who won't pay, pay you even if you deliver well above spec. Then there is steady funding. A good partner will honor their part of the agreement. You can focus on game development, which is probably what a majority of your team will want to do. You automatically get reach that you wouldn't have as an independent by yourself. You can create it perhaps through luck or talent in marketing, but it takes effort. A major publisher will just bring that to the table because that's what they do. And you'll get, and this is perhaps to me the most important thing, experienced help. Senior producers who've been around, formed their own companies, seen lots of businesses, seen lots of games who come in and feedback and give you hands-on tips. And they're not always dictating what to do and to chuck that out. But they might be pointing very constructively out that this rarely works or if you do this it will eat 90% of, of your CPU. Do you want that, really? That was an example that had no foundation in reality, that last one. Anyway, the cons are, should be obvious. There's financial dependency. If they decide that your project is not prioritized, it's a beautiful, this has happened to Tasha, beautiful project, full funding, full blast. High up in Japan, someone says, no, we won't support this, what do I know, Move Toy or Wonderbook or Vita platform, something. It's not prioritized for this fiscal year. Snip goes to project, what do you do? You did nothing wrong. Less creative influence, this should be, uh, it has been sp spoken to by the previous lecturer, but it should be uh, self-explanatory. They own the money, they can dictate things. It's very hard to re retain ownership of the IP or even serious influence over an IP if you work with a really big publisher like EA or Sony. They're not very interested. Only if you eat huge amount of risk and do at least half of the funding will you see any of the IP in your own hands. And since you were in this to begin with, maybe to avoid major risk, that's, that's an important decision for you. And there's an income cap, because yes, maybe you'll get a royalty, but if they've funded you, eaten the risk, published the thing, that royalty will be, I don't know, 3%, 5%, 8%, 10% if you have a brutal negotiator. And you'll only see any of that thing come back to you, oh lord, uh, well after uh, they've recouped their investment. So it needs to be really successful. And when you work with a major publisher, it's, it's not, no longer a differentiation between whether they're free, if they're digital, if they're physical, if they're pay to play. There are publishers of all descriptions these days, I'm just saying. But what's true of them is, why are they interested in you? Remember, you have agency, you make your own decisions. You need to figure out what they, why they are interested in even signing anything with you. Game development takes a lot out of you. It's like any major project in life. You have to love it. You have to believe in the games you do and the work you do. If you're just a jaded, tired old person, you're not going to produce to the quality required and you're going to start slipping. You can't afford an attitude at your studio like, well, the work for hire is something we do just to fund our own dreams. We don't really invest. We don't really want to succeed. We don't need to like, uh, surmount or exceed expectations. Yes, you do. And why, why are you interested in that particular publisher? One, how long do you plan on working with them? Forever? For 10 years? For five years? And are there any value adds? For instance, I mean, this is the famous exa entrepreneurial example. Learn from everyone, follow no one. You're exposed to a ton of good pipelining and best practices and experience. Massive entertainment in Malmö, for instance, you went on record recently. 
and said something to the effect of, uh, look, Ubisoft has been a school to us to really show us full featured AAA like Assassin's Creed. And now we're ready to do the division and we feel we can deliver that to top notch international quality. But it wasn't an equal relationship. It's a game of imperfect information. Chess, perfect information. You can see the entire board. A game of imperfect information is like poker. Someone, you can't see all the ramifications. So they're playing chess pretty much. They have much more information than you do. They built the maze. <laughs> and you're the rat. How do you work with that massive info advantage over pricing and market and other studios and general business intelligence? And why, you, what you need to start asking, why do they want you? I have two examples. I'm a little bit pressed for time because we're, uh, so I need to shorten them down because we had technical difficulties in the opening. But basically, when I ran one company, they came to us and said, please make a mobile MMO like this and make it for no money at all. And we said, uh, we can't do that. We can't pay anything, rent, salaries. And they said, well, we have several studios in Japan who can say they can do this. Why can't you? And I said, that's great. Go to them. This is the deal of a lifetime. Go to them and get that game made. You'll be rich. Three months later, they came back. So about that MMO, how much do you think you'd need to make that? They went to us because they didn't really have anyone else to go to, of course. But they'd never say that. Another thing, this summer we were trying to pitch a PSN game to Sony and everything looked great. Uh, they liked it, they said they wanted to really give it, a sh give it a good shot. And after their internal pitching session, they came back and said, no, sorry, we decided to go with other options. Why? Well, it's a great game, but there were other great games also. And some of those studios were new to us and we couldn't tie them to a network and bring them in to the Sony family and sort of get them under our wings unless we offered them to fund their new pitched project. With you, we can give you this LVP project and we keep you funded. So actually, having been a good loyal partner was not to our best advantage at that time. So every publisher loves your studio the most, they keep telling you, until one day they don't. And you need to be on the lookout for all those signals. I think that was touched upon in the previous lecture as well. You have to know what you're getting out of it and look for signals when you're not getting out of it, the things you want to get out of it and you need to know what they're getting out of it, today and tomorrow. And you're not the only bird in that nest, not the only chick. Now, one of the most important things if you work under a big publisher as an indie is to realize that internal marketing is maybe your most important effort. That's the only real business development you get to do. You need to know what other studios are pitching, what their strengths are, what the platform you're targeting really needs so that your pitch has a good chance of becoming a successful, favored, prioritized, high-budget game that will get released and will see success. And your partner, you need to know your partner. And I'm not talking about Sony or EA. You need to know the person, the people. Who are they? What do they want? What kind of food do they like? Yes, but also what kind of games do they feel inspired by and what do they believe in? Like we tried to pitch a free-to-play-ish concept at one point to Sony, and they looked really uncomfortable. Like, oh, no, I, I don't know. This is a lot of strange stuff going on here. And, and then we removed that and said, this concept has cleared up tremendously. It's a real tar share concept now. We can really see this happening. That free-to-play mumbo jumbo, that was really a, a bit of a disaster, don't you? Yes, yes, it was terrible. Because they weren't ready for it. Those producers had no real opening to free-to-play and felt uncomfortable. Uh, and I could speak for ages about different people I've met with different needs. Like when we worked with Microsoft and they were still running Waterfall for the Xbox launch and expect the documentation to be complete in every detail months ahead. And if like the tweak value of the, of the turn speed of one single car was different from the design document from five months ago, they would fail the milestone because the designer had tweaked it during the night before the delivery, and it worked better and it was more entertaining, but it wasn't a spec. So what do they want? You need to know that. And you need to have people smarts. And this all turns into a game of poker, an ongoing running poker tournament, yes? It means new chances, new parameters keep materializing. You have to have the right product that, with the right publisher at the right time and market conditions, with the right team to back it up, and the right publicity, and unless you have a strategy, unless you know what you want to achieve, it's just hard on. You have to have a good team and a good product and all that stuff. And you have to watch the game like a hawk, watch the people around you like a hawk. 
to be able to work success, success through a major publisher. This is, I think, my last slide. My favorite quote for today. Society is like a stew. If you don't stir it up from time to time, once in a while, then a layer of scum floats to the top by Edward Abbey. What that means is that even the largest publishers need to reinvent themselves. They need creativity. They will tie studios to themselves that can have hold within them the promise of a new IP of a really cool game mechanic. And if you can show them that and you can work your creativity within those frames, then you can have success and individual attention if that is something you're after. Think about the risks. Don't be one of those studios that they only think of as cost control. You can't cost too much, just get it out there. Be the kind of studio that is more towards high risk, high reward. We work in the middle ground. We run our own internal R&D team. We have our own developments. But most of our work is work for hire. <laughs> is this going to work? Is this going to be successful for Tasha? I don't know. Now for the question session. Does anybody know of a successful company that runs this sort of two-legged strategy, run their own IPs, also do work for hire? I'll leave that to the questions. Any questions from the audience? Sorry again. Um, how do you uh, keep in check the cost that the publisher charges for like marketing and other stuff? Uh, obviously, a publisher wouldn't be transparent about it. Um, so, uh, uh, do you wor only work with people that, are, or do you demand such transparency? This is interesting. Usually, you don't. You are, this is a perfect manifestation of that game of imperfect information. Very hard for you to control that the numbers they give you. Sales, uh, anything, marketing spend. But you can, what you can do is say you can define income relative to the development cost in your terms, for instance, because those you know and can see. So there are actions you can take and make sure they don't include numbers that you have no insight into. Right, but you said like, uh, for example, working on a royalty basis after sales, you have no control over that. So they, they can keep uh, keeping, uh, uh, keeping in costs and stuff for years after release maybe. They certainly can. And the more of an investment you've made, the more harsh you can be in your terms. I mean, you can ask to look at their you know, to have insight into their, uh, their hard numbers that an ac independent accountant has looked at that is usually secret. If, if the contract is written in such a fashion that you have a right to know where the spend is going, if you are closer to being an equal partner. But again, this will probably only be possible to run as a negotiation if you've invested your own money and your own capital. As long as you kind of sit in the back seat and get paid, they're not going to offer the transparency and you'll be very vulnerable to exactly those tactics. And then a second question, if I may. Uh, you mentioned that you worked with Sony um, on, a, uh, on your own titles. You wanted to get funded. Was that through the Sony Pop Fund? Uh, no. I'll, without going into great detail, our first stop is always external development. But if they say no, we can go on to any other arm in Sony and talk to them. And after that, we need to negotiate if we want to try and release something in any other fashion than self-funded, self-released on PC or PlayStation format. It's in the contract. Any other questions, guys? Well, thank you very much, Olaf. Thank you.